Hello, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church Online. Thank you for joining us in worship today. As we continue on learning about our faith, spurring us on to works, and demonstrating that through our life, there's an example in the Bible that points to a man who had such great faith. He was willing to, to bring his son to Jesus. And this poor son, he had been suffering through seizures and demonic possession, and it was so bad that the boy would be cast into fire and be physically injured. And so this is a, a story from Mark chapter 9, and I'll read this for you. It's so after the man brings his son to Jesus, Jesus says this, How long has this been happening to him? And the father said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And with that proclamation, Jesus cast out the spirit from the boy and he was cleansed. And what a wonderful picture that the father in his brokenness, really at the end of his rope, when he felt like he had no other place to turn to, he turns to Jesus, the Son of God. And he wasn't a perfect man by any means. He admitted that his faith wasn't perfect. Help my belief, unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. And a lot of times in our walk as well, sometimes we doubt God. And a lot of times in our life, our lives aren't perfect, and we mess up. But the beauty of the God who is there for us, who is always faithful, is that he welcomes us back. And even if we have just the tiniest bit of faith, asking him to fill us and to restore us and to forgive us, we can have a right relationship with him. And so just as this father in the New Testament demonstrated so much love and so much faith that the result was Jesus healing his son. So much that it points to our Heavenly Father and his love for us that if we would have faith and demonstrate that through our love, he can work wonders as well. And so with that in mind, would you join me in prayer and worship together? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we could call you Abba, Father, that we have a personal, intimate connection with you, that you're not a God who's far off, but you're one who's near, one who cares for us deeply and richly, enough to send your only Son to die on our behalf. And what a sacrifice that must have been, your only child, and yet you still chose to do that for us sinners. And so we ask that as we come before you, that we would sing, that we would praise as we read your word, that these things wouldn't go in one ear and out the other. But may we be hearers of the word and doers as well. Father, would you impress your spirit upon our hearts? Would you transform us from the inside out, that it would result in lasting change? Thank you for this time that we have to come before you. Father, we believe and help our unbelief. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Father's love for us. That 
that he would send his only son to come and rescue us. He has saved us, called us blameless, guided us now and will sustain us. Oh, how wonderful the Father's love. Your mercy floods our lives with kindness. Your grace has covered all we see, and you have promised not to leave. You freely give your spirit to us So we can be sure we're sons of God And rest in the hope of what's to come How wonderful the Father's love, the Father's love for us That He would send His only Son to come and rescue us he has saved us called us blameless guides us now and will sustain us oh how wonderful the father's love the sufferings they fill our lives we're confident we're heirs with christ and so we cry, Abba, Father. Those sufferings, they fill our lives. We're confident, we're heirs with Christ. And so we cry, Abba, Father. How wonderful the Father's love, the Father's love for us. That he would send his only son to come and rescue us. How wonderful the Father's love, the Father's love for us. That he would send his only son to come and rescue us. He has saved us, called us blameless, guides us down and will sustain us. Oh, how wonderful the Father's your strength, oh God. Give us your strength, oh God, and courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want, whatever 
remember the test. My grace will preach your gospel till our dying breath. Let your kingdom come. Let your If I told you my story, you would hear that I never gave up. If I told you my story, you would hear that, but it wasn't mine. If I should speak. Of Jesus. 
A couple of years ago, I had a conference to go to in Canada, and as I was preparing to go, I realized about a week ahead of time that my passport was expired. And so I called the airline and I talked to somebody who said, oh, that's okay, all you need is a birth certificate. So I realized that I didn't have a birth certificate and I went to four different locations to get one. I just got sent and it was just a rabbit chase uh, well, like a day before I was supposed to fly out. So I go with my birth certificate and I get to the airline and, and, uh, and they said, you can't go to Canada without a passport. And I said, it expired and I called and somebody just said, I just need a birth certificate. And I said, no, not even Canadians can get in without a passport. They needed proof of my identification that I belonged to the United States. James, our author today, is saying that we need proof of our genuine faith. As travel requires an identity, so does Christianity requiring proof of our identity. And the proof that James says for our faith is our works. The things that we do that comes out of our lives that demonstrate the reality of our faith. Our works will confirm or deny the reality of what we say we are. If we say we're a Christian, but we have a foul mouth, our morals are, are jeopardized routinely, we are immoral in our lifestyle, we are more concerned about the material than the spiritual, then people will have good reason to question the validity of our Christianity. You say you're a Christian, but you don't prove it. Prove it. Show it to me. Rather, James says, when we take care of the widows and the orphans, those that are in genuine need, and keep our lives unspotted from the world, that is proof of real religion. That is proof of genuine faith. Many ask me, as our church goes through, and all churches around the world are going through this COVID-19 shelter in place, what's it going to be like afterwards? Are people still going to be committed to church and Fellowship Bible Church, or will they have found other uh, greener pastures online? And, you know, the question is, I don't know. We'll see. I hope the reality of our faith is coming through during this time of shelter in place. Good works in our lives will demonstrate the reality of our faith in Christ. There are so many Zoom meetings, <laughs> and, the, and, uh, and there's a, a, a limit where we might say, I feel like I'm getting Zoomed out. But will that take away our passion for ministering to one another? The body of Christ is really important. Does it matter to me that I see them? Or am I just tired of social media and I don't want to see anybody? Right? See, these, these are the attitudes that will be proving our salvation. They'll be proving our um, commitment to the local church. Is my worship genuine even though I'm watching on YouTube? Am, am I truly worshiping God? See, these are proofs and evidences that our faith is real or genuine. Is my worship through giving only motivated when the plate is passed around? Will church still matter to me even when we come back together again? 
See, these are questions that, that we need to ask ourselves that will demonstrate the reality of our faith and commitment to Christ. So proof is in what we do. We can talk a good talk, but it's what we do that really demonstrates the reality of what's inside us. And so with that in mind, James gives us four marks of genuine faith from James chapter 2, verses 19 to 26. So let's take a look at these four marks. The first mark is that genuine faith is more than just knowing. Genuine faith is more than just knowing. Verse 19 says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Thumbs up, says James. And then he throws in this little jab. Even the demons believe and shudder, tremble, fear. And so what James is referring to, we have to remember, he's speaking to a pretty religious audience, one that has come out of Judaism and have trusted Christ as their Savior, and so they're Jewish Christians. And so they would be very familiar with the statement he says that you believe that God is one. What James is reciting is a portion of what's called the Shema. The Shema it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and it is repeated by dedicated Jewish believers every morning and evening. They will say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. So, so here is this, this repetitious religious phrase that would prove the commitment of a religious Jewish individual. And he says, all right, you recite creeds. You can say a Bible verse. You do well. That's, that's a good thing that you're monotheistic. But that doesn't necessarily save you. Because the demons believe, and yet they fear. So it is more than just an intellectual assent to knowing that God exists, to knowing that God is a creator. There must be a personal knowledge of God that only comes through a relationship through Jesus Christ. See, even the demons are monotheistic. The Muslims are monotheistic. Jews are monotheistic. Christians are monotheistic, even liberal ones. And he says you can have this correct understanding that God is one. There's only one God in contrast to the pagan gods. That's why during the time of Moses, it was reiter reiterated time and time again, there's only one God versus the pagans who had so many in their pantheon, their, their, their library of gods. But yet, that's not enough just to have good orthodox beliefs. So they were religious, but yet there wasn't really any life or evidence of their faith. And then when he says that even the demons believe, he adds two more words. He says, and shudders, and tremble, and fear, depending on the translation that you have. There's a reaction that the demons have to their understanding that God is one. They fear God, but they don't have Jesus as their savior. They're not rightly related to God but they have an intellectual understanding that causes even more than what other religious people have, fear. A lot of people don't fear God, and the demons even fear God, even though they're not saved. They're not going to be in heaven. They'll be condemned to an eternity in the lake of fire. So genuine faith is more than just knowing. So you may have grown up in church. You might have come from a Christian family. You might have read through the Bible. You might have memorized verses in vacation Bible school. You might go to youth group or you might go to an adult Bible study. And just because you have Christian knowledge doesn't mean that you're genuinely saved. I shared last week how there's three components to genuine faith. 
There is an intellectual understanding. Faith must be reasonable. There is an emotional understanding. There must be the sense of confidence. And then there is a, a, a volitional or a will portion to faith where we make a commitment to place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. There's faith on the positive side. There's repentance on the negative side. But each is doing the same thing together. So intellectually, we know the facts of the gospel and faith. In repentance, we know that we're hell-bound sinners. And so, the, so knowing that we've sinned against God and what our destination is, we want to put our trust in Jesus Christ. Emotionally, we feel confident in the saving power of Christ, but on the repentance side, we are remorseful. We're broken in the fact that we have sinned and offended our Creator, our Holy God, our Heavenly Father who wants to love us and have a relationship with us, and yet we're running from Him. So the, the flip side of faith and is repentance, and emotionally, we know what Christ has done for us, but we're also sad that we have offended him, so we want to get right. It's like when a, when a husband upsets his wife, and it's an emotional realizing, oh, I've, I've hurt you. That's the same type of emotional sense we need to have in our faith towards God. And then the will comes in and the decision to trust Christ alone, not our works, not our religion, not our church, not our Christian family, not our Christian heritage, not our denomination, but Christ alone. And so we decide on the repentance side to turn from our sin and submit to Christ as Lord and Savior. Now what James is talking about is in the fourth column here is the incomplete approach where there's only a mental acknowledgement. There is only the sense that Okay, I, I believe in God, and then we leave it at that. We have to make sure that our faith is in the right thing about God. It's not just knowing that God exists, but it's knowing that he sent his son from heaven to become a man, to die on the cross, so that by becoming a man, he can represent us. By dying on the cross, he would pay the penalty for our sin. He would bear God's wrath for us while he was on the cross when he who knew no sin became sin for us. And so those are the correct facts that we must believe, not just pick and choose. Augustine said, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. And a lot of what these people people are doing in verse 19 who say they believe in God but will not trust in the full gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are just picking and choosing what they want to believe. It's not believing God, it's believing yourself. The demons rejected God. They fear. So make sure that you're a Christian. You can be going through church, you can be going through your life and not really be a Christian. Are you trusting in Christ alone? Do you have faith completely in him? Have you repented of your sin and your sinfulness? There was a famous pastor, theologian, uh, and evangelist. His name is John Wesley, some 300 years ago. He would be very scholarly. He memorized many portions of the Greek New Testament he was really consistent with his devotions in the scripture, and he was a missionary to the indigent uh, Indian population here in America. He was doing all of these things, and then he realized he himself wasn't truly saved. The gospel that he had been telling others about, he hadn't fully put his trust in. And so he had to make a decision to trust Christ, even after he was doing all of these religious things. There's a friend of mine who is married to a pastor who I serve with. And decades into her being a pastor's wife, leading ladies uh, groups and Bible studies and, and being a really good person, 
she realized she had not trusted Christ as her Savior after doing all of these religious things. So as James says, you can recite the Shema. You can know that God is monotheistic. He's one God. There aren't many gods. There's one. And he says, you do well. But the demons also have that same understanding, and they fear. They at least have an emotional response to their understanding. What do we have that comes out of our understanding of God? The second mark is, to genu that, is uh, that genuine faith is demonstrated through sacrificial obedience. So here, what James is doing is giving four illustrations. First, he gives one from uh, the, uh, the religious and the demons. The second is Abraham. The third is Rahab. And the fourth, he uses death as an illustration of faith without works. So two are negative. We just went through the negative one. Now he gives a positive example in the life of Abraham. And so genuine faith is demonstrated through sacrificial obedience there was a time when uh, when abraham put his faith in this promise that god made with abraham it's in genesis chapter 15 verse 6 we call it the abrahamic covenant and abraham believed and put his faith in god now this is 1800 plus years before jesus would come so people go, well, how were people saved in the Old Testament before Jesus? By faith. It's never changed. Uh, and, uh, and even though he didn't intellectually know who Jesus was, he trusted God would provide a sacrifice. 30 years after he put his faith in God, he would be called to offer his son Isaac up as a sacrifice. And so here we come to this passage of James 2, verse 20. It says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Are you trying to argue, argue with James in a counter way that you can have faith and not demonstrate it by your works? I mean, you need proof of being an American when you travel. He's saying here, you need proof if you're going to say you're a Christian. You're going to give me the counter-argument that it doesn't matter? You don't need proof or ID? Then he goes on and talks about Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now, what James is saying is that Abraham's works did not save him. Remember that when the Apostle Paul talks about justification by faith, being made right by being made right by placing your faith in Christ. He's, uh, Paul talks about it from the front end. James talks about it from the back end. And so, so before you become a Christian, God does everything, right? He saves you. Jesus did all the work. All you need to do is put your faith in Jesus, and then you will be counted for salvation. But if you're genuinely saved, it would be demonstrated on the other side by your good works. And this is what James is saying, that his works justified his faith when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of god so james is not denying that you were saved by faith alone he refers to that here abraham believed god and it was counted to him as righteousness he was the friend of god you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone so what he's saying is the backside of justification the works that Abraham demonstrated was this great thing that demonstrated the reality of his faith. When we take a look at Genesis 22, which is the chapter where Abraham takes his son 
to the top of Mount Moriah, which is the future site of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not in existence yet as a city. And so here he takes them up there, and he says, Take your only son Isaac, whom you love. He asks for what we love. And I know a lot of times you would have a tight-fisted hand and say, I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give my loved one up. I don't want to give my kids up. And yet, Abraham was willing to do that. Now, he waited for an offering to come, but one didn't come. He also realized that Isaac was the son of promise, that he was the one through whom the line would continue to bring about, one who would bless all nations, eventually the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come through Israel, who would come through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so Abraham was ready to offer up his son. Now you might say, what a horrible thing. But he had every faith to trust God to bring Isaac back down that hill. He believed in the resurrection. Hebrews 11 says, by faith he offered his son. He had confidence that, in the, that Christ would resurrect his son, so he was willing to give him up, believing fully in the resurrection. This is a beautiful picture of our faith, that we fully put our trust in Jesus Christ, knowing that not only will he save us from death, he will resurrect us. That's why we don't need to fear death. That's why we don't need to fear COVID-19. We need to be careful. We need to take precautions because we don't want to get anybody else sick. But if it happens to us, we have full confidence that he will save us. So with that confidence, we see that Abraham trusted and obeyed God. Again, we see in Romans chapter 4 that this is Paul writing in the book of Romans talking about the front end of Abraham's justification by faith. What should we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So it wasn't works that saved him, otherwise he'd be boasting. We are not saved by works, lest we boast. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, his faith is what gave him righteousness. His faith that God would redeem him from his sin, save him from his sin. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. But to the one, and to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So here, we have the call. Will we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not about our religious works that gets us to heaven. Right? It's not about our religion that gets us to heaven. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Paul again confirms this in Galatians. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, that term counted, that's an accounting term. It's put into the credit. Right? It's the debit of sin is removed and the credit of righteousness is placed into our account. So, so that the term counted is that accounting term and concept that righteousness is now deposited in our accounts. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of God. All right, so Paul is talking about the front end. Here, faith is free. James is then using the same illustration of Abraham and saying, now, what comes out on the other side of justification is good works. Abraham, according to Paul, was justified by faith. That's how he got saved. But because he was saved in God, he obeyed. He had full confidence in the death and resurrection that was promised. And so he was able to do good works based on his faith in the resurrection. What good work proceeds from our justification? How can we, like Abraham, demonstrate our confidence in the hope of the gospel? And so we get a negative example from the demons uh, that's saying belief isn't enough. We get a positive illustration from Abraham who, whose good works 
resulted in obedience, and he carried out what God asked him to do. And of course, for those of you who aren't familiar with the story, he does not sacrifice his son. He wanted to see his heart. God provide, provided a sacrifice uh, of, of a, an animal that got stuck in, into the thicket, into the bushes out there. And, and Abraham rejoiced, said, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. He provides us a savior. The third mark of genuine faith is that genuine faith is proven through selfless service. Genuine faith is proven through selfless service. Here's another positive example. After Abraham, James talks about Rahab. He used Abraham, who was the patriarch, the man of God that everybody respects. And then he talks about Rahab, who was a woman of ill repute who would put her trust in God. A wonderful model for those who were thinking, I'm so sinful in my life, how could I ever serve God? And yet he used Rahab, who would eventually be in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. But check out verse 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute, now we know uh, her occupation, by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Rahab was an enemy of God by the people that she was from. Her, she was a Canaanite. Her particular tribe in Canaan was the Amorites. The Amorites hated God. Their, their culture was strongly anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-truth. Her name, Ra, comes from the Egyptian sun god. And so here she is, Rahab. Her name means insolent and fierce. Here she was of an occupation that was seen as immoral. And yet her position, her job afforded her prime real estate location on the wall of the city all right she wasn't inside the city she was on the wall which was where strange foreign men would come and to into a place of harlotry and it would not have been unusual for foreign men to come and it would not have been unusual for her to hide men from their suspecting wives So what happens is Joshua sends two spies to scope out Jericho. This is is in preparation to take the land that was promised by God, but occupied by people who wouldn't submit to God. Those people who submitted to God were asked to join in with God, and those that hated God would be called to repent, would be given an opportunity like Rahab was given to worship god remember she was an amorite given an opportunity to trust god for salvation so rahab had to make a choice she had to obey god and so here we go back to joshua 2 where joshua the son of nun right that's uh, who's the first orphan of the bible that would be joshua because he was the son of (laughs) nun that's an old joke Well, Joshua sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Later on in Joshua 2, we see that the king of Jericho would uh, come and say, Rahab, show us where these men are. And instead of producing them, they said, Oh, well, you know, they, they, they just took off. But she had hid them. And he went, oh, well, she lied. Well, that, that, that's another story. But, but here we see her faith. Is, she, she trusted in God. And what I'm really moved by is not just the story of her hiding the men and protecting the men who were servants of God, but it was her confession that she would, uh, she would make in the later part of Joshua 2. She recognized God's will. She goes, I know that the Lord has given you the land. All right, so this land of Jericho occupied by the Amorites, all right, we, we, 
we know that this is part of the promised land that you promised to Moses. Right? So she knows this. So she has this knowledge. Then she responds to God's power. The fear of you has fallen upon us. All right, so people might have knowledge, but here she goes further with fear. The demons have knowledge. They fear, but they're not quite there yet. And they won't be because they've fallen short. But here she has knowledge, and then she has fear. Verse 9, the fear you, uh, of you has fallen upon us. Verse 10 says she knows of God's works. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you came out of Egypt, and, that you, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. All right? We've heard the stories. We have heard the old stories, right? And so, so here, the one of how Israel crossed the Red Sea and how God took down the two kings of the Amorites. So here is this confession of Rahab where she's admitting what she knows, how she's feeling. Uh, verse 11, how she reacted with, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. Right? Here we're saying, here is a God we cannot contend with. It is better for me to submit than to resist this God. That's faith and repentance working hand in hand. It's not just an intellectual religion. It is faith and repentance, emotion and intellect working together here with the will. Then she confesses in verse 11, For the Lord your God, He is God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. He is Lord. He is King. And then, verse 13, beautifully, she doesn't ask for money. She doesn't ask for be more beauty or new clothes. She asks for salvation of her family. Verse 13 that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. All right, not just my family, but the people who are with my family and who support and serve with my family. All right, will you protect them? So here she submits to God, and she's trusting in God for protection and salvation. And you know the, the beautiful story that even when Jericho fell, uh, her place was left standing in the wall with her family and friends inside. That is why, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. By faith. She would risk arrest from the Jericho king. She would risk being killed by Amorite kings and the legal system. But she knew that there was something greater than an evil government, and that was God. And she sacrificially served God by taking care of the spies of Joshua. So we have a negative example from the demons, a positive example from Abraham and Rahab. And then the fourth mark of genuine faith is illustrated by the concept of death. Genuine faith is demonstrated by godly deeds. Verse 26, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead... So also, faith apart from works is dead. Now, this is a, a pretty simple illustration that he's using because we know what death is. It happens to everyone. It happens to everybody we love. Everybody we hate, and it happens to as well. And it'll happen to us. Death is physically when the soul is removed from the body. That's death. That's physical death. Spiritual death is when the soul is removed from God. Physical death is when the soul is removed from the body. That's why he says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead. He talks about what physical death is. Then he relates that to our talk of faith. If you don't have works, it's dead. It's, it's removed. The life of Christ is removed from your religion if there are no good works. So, what godly works are you doing during this time of shelter in place that demonstrate the reality of your Christian faith? You say you're a Christian. What have you been doing in this time when we are sheltered in our homes to minister to others? 
I am grateful for the creative ways that our church is trying to serve others in the church and in the community. Will you live up to what you say your faith is through good works? So in conclusion, what does our faith say about us? Number one, is your faith in Christ genuine? Have you truly trusted in Christ as your Savior? If you do, how do you know it? How do you know What is proof for you that you have genuinely trusted in Christ? Has his loving sacrifice motivated you to do the same? How will others know of the sincerity of your faith? We talk a good talk. We know a lot of Bible verses. We even know monotheism and the gospel. But how will others know it? <clears throat> Secondly, how does the saving work of Christ on the cross motivate us regularly to serve others like Christ served us? See, what, what motivates us is that, wow, look what Christ had to give up for my salvation. He had to die for me. He had to leave heaven to become a man for me. He had to take the sins of Steve Wong on himself when he became my substitute sacrifice. He did that for me. How is that going to motivate me to give to others? There's a, lo a, a lot of times our, our motivation is motivated by, well, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of church? What am I going to get by going into this Zoom meeting? What am I going to get uh, you know, by doing this ministry? Well, what's in it for me? Versus, look at all that Christ gave up. Why am I not sacrificing like Christ? The third question, how would we distinguish if our good works are trying to earn salvation versus demonstrating a salvation we already possess? How do we know that our good works aren't ahead of justification and then we're trying to do all of these things? Oh, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to give to church. I'm going to serve. I'm going to memorize the Bible and I'm going to help old ladies across the street. And hopefully I'm going to have more good works than bad works. See, that's what happened with John Wesley. He thought by doing his devotions, by being a missionary, that all those things would help him get to heaven. And he had to realize it wasn't his works. It was the work of Christ alone that he had to put his faith in. Are your good works trying to earn salvation, or are your good works because of the great sacrifice Christ gave for us, and it's flowing on the backside of evidence of real faith? And then lastly... Think about this. If we asked an unsaved family member, a friend, a classmate that doesn't know Christ, and a co-worker and or a co-worker, if our faith in Christ seems genuine, what would they say and why? Is it because we're not demonstrating the genuineness of our faith? We talk a good talk, but they don't see our love, our sacrifice, our grace, our mercy, our servant spirit, our emulation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can talk it, but can we walk it? Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for these four examples, two negative, two positive, of what it means to live out our faith. Father, I pray that today we will be analytical of our own lives and realize that people are looking for more than just talk. We need to show it. And it's been a lot harder in this COVID-19 shelter in place to show our faith. Father, I pray that you will help us who truly know you to push ourselves even harder to serve like Christ served. That we would risk even death. We would risk even infection to serve others, not to be foolish, but to know that there are needs to be met. And we will meet needs, no matter the cost, even death. Father, who knows what will come out of COVID, how that will affect each of us, how that will affect our church. But the real proof will be in our commitment to you and the gospel, even when this is over. And so, Father, I pray that uh, even as persecution 
has purified the church in countries that face persecution. Father, may there be a great sense of realization that our faith is real and it's going to be costly through good works and sacrifice to demonstrate. Father, thank you for your son who emulates that very sacrificial giving of good works. Because of his work, we are saved. And it's because of his name we pray. Amen. Do something great for our community and our church today. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Steve, uh, for your message this week. Hi, uh, Fellowship Bible Church family. We really appreciate uh, you uh, joining us on this Sunday. I'm going to bring your attention to a few announcements. Uh, first off, um, our annual day camp ministry um, has been changed. We've been kind of holding out to try to find out what, what the government was going to do, what, how the virus was settling in, and we decided to, for the safety of all, to change our summer ministry from a day camp in person, even though we were very much like, love to see people in person, um, we, we just know at this time with so many unknown variables that we just can't do that. And so for our safety, we're going to move to a virtual vacation Bible school. And this virtual vacation Bible school will be held in, in two sessions, and you can sign up for one of them. It's June 22nd to 29th or July 6th to 10. It's from 9.30 to 12 noon, and it is called My Big Screen Adventure. And we are, we are going to be viewing um, the Jesus film, and it's a special uh, film that's designated for the children. And so um, it, it's, a, it's really a great film, and we're going to have discussion on it, but we're going to look at the life of Christ. And uh, if you want to register, please register on the slide below or go to our website. Uh, in preparation for our Vacation Bible School, we do have some meetings planned. So we have our first staff meeting today from 2.15 to 3.30 um, um, with, via Zoom. And so uh, all staff members, please click on that. Uh, if you are, are a staff member as well, our first training meeting is going to be next Sunday, May 31st. And that is going to be from 11 o'clock to 12. And for four consecutive Sundays, we'll have this training for our staff members, and so please join us for that. Um, our discipleship training is also here today. Um, it's from one o'clock to two o'clock, and we, um, we are meeting as disciplers. We're gonna be talking about motivating our disciples and how important it is, especially with our shelter in place. Pastor Steve's theology class continues. He is uh, leading a study on the Trinity, and uh, uh, what a fascinating topic, even though we don't, hear the word or see the word trinity in the scriptures the bible clearly teaches that there's three persons of the godhead and so come learn about the trinity the scholarship fund is still going on and we are trying to give to those who are aiming for full-time ministry and so if you like to give to this uh to this ministry you can contact eric fong or you can go online at our website and look at uh, and click on the give and you can give via that way our missionary of the week is Jim and Betty Brown. Jim and Betty Brown specialize in discipleship, and at one time they can have 30 different discipleship relationships going. And so pray for them because everything's been gone, it has been moved virtually, and so he is still connecting with folks. We want to pray for their health. They have recently moved to South Carolina, and so we pray that their ministry will continue strong uh, there. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. So good to uh, be here with you. And uh, may you continue to live out your faith every day in Christ's name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the scriptures and we thank you for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for um, giving us the ability to live for you. And through the spirit of God uh, that guides us, Lord, we can make wise decisions and we can be guided by you step by step. So help us to stay close to you. Help us not just to know our faith, Help us to live out our faith. And um, we, we pray for Jim and Betty Brown, Lord. Thank you for their ministry and the discipleship and how important that is as they connect with individuals. You've given them such great uh, experiences and biblical knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Help them to continue to pass this on to other folks who really need it. A lot of new Christians, a lot of 
uh, longtime Christians. And uh, watch over them, Lord, as they adjust to their new location in South Carolina. Thank you, Lord, for this week. Uh, um, bl just bless um, all that we do and bring glory to your name. In Christ's name, amen.